critical utopian socialism and communism. Uh, all right, and, and notice that these are, are lumped together because Marx and Engels see communism developing directly out of critical utopian socialism. Okay, it's utopian, but it's also critical, and when they mean critical, they mean like it's analytic. It really does try to analyze uh, the class struggle. Okay. We do not here refer to that literature which in every great modern revolution has always been uh, given voice to the demands of the proletariat, such as the writings of Babouf and others. The first direct attempts of the proletariat to attain its own ends made in times of universal excitement when feudal society was being overthrown, these attempts necessarily failed owing to the then undeveloped state of the proletariat, as well as the absence of the economic conditions for its emancipation, conditions that it had uh, yet to be produced and could be produced by the impending bourgeois epic alone. Okay, so uh, there was a growing proletariat in uh, during the first French Revolution. Uh, Babeuf and others were kind of radical writers, you know, that were championing the working class or the peasants, uh, and, but these, this is not, you know, genuine socialism because the, the conditions of the proletariat uh, that exist in, you know, 1847, 1848 haven't yet arised, and as Marx and Engels see it, it's the conditions that exist in 1848 that are ripe for the emancipation, for the liberation of the proletariat. And, um, and, and so again, it's a being not at the right place in the historical progression. So a lot of this has to do with their historical materialism. Um, the revolutionary literature, which was genuinely revolutionary, that accompanied these first moments of the proletariat, had necessarily a reactionary character. It inculcated, it inculcated universal asceticism and social leveling in its crudest form. The socialist and communist systems properly so called, those of Saint-Simon, Fourier, and Owen and others spring into existence in the early undeveloped period described above of the struggle between proletariat and bourgeoisie. Okay, so uh, there's some revolutionary but reactionary sort of murmurings and proto-socialism and out of those ideas floating about um, because of the French Revolution and other revolutionary moments, you have people like Saint-Simon, Fourier, and Owen. And we saw Robert Owen uh, we spent, you know, I spent a good time, amount of time describing his utopian socialism uh, because that's a good example. Okay, and Fourier was very similar um, and also tried to start communes and, and was very successful. Lots of people followed his program uh, and Saint-Simon was a little more intellectual uh, but also uh, had many followers, you know, so this is experimental socialism but a, ut a utopian kind of socialism. But Marx and Engels see this as much more authentic than the other forms of socialism that they've discussed up to this point. Okay, the founders of these systems see indeed the class antagonisms as well as the action of the decomposing elements in the prevailing form of society. But the proletariat as yet in its infancy offers to them the spectacle of a class without any historical initiative or any independent political movement. Okay, now this is important, uh, and I see this in student papers all the time, is <clears throat> when the question of liberation comes about, and like in the context of liberation theology, liberating the poor, um, students often think that the, the, liber the poor have to be liberated by the rich. The poor have to be liberated by the bourgeoisie uh, liberals. And, and it's the, the compassion of the bourgeoisie that will lift the poor up out of their 
out of their condition. Uh, but that's entirely contrary to the way that Marx and Engels develop it, and that's in entirely contrary to the way that like Gutierrez and Romero uh, develop the concept of the poor and the, uh, the liberatory strength of the gospel as they understand it, the, that preferential option for the poor. In the, in the context of Gutierrez, and Romero, what they are saying is that through, you know, and they do put this in Christian terms and religious terms, so let's not, uh, let's not uh, obfuscate that here. So they, they believe that through the gospel message, poor people can be liberated spiritually. And by being liberated spiritually, they can become effective actors in society on their own account. They don't need the help. Once they've been liberated spiritually, they can become a historical class, you know, acting within history and within politics to transform society in a better direction that the poor can self-organize and the poor can help themselves. They just need to be inspired uh, to do so. And, and really uh, what Gutierrez and Romero found as they began to think in this way is that the poor were inspiring them, that the poor were more spiritual than they, right? Uh, that there is, you know, there is this inherent spirituality to the poor uh, that can be a liberatory force and that can be a revolutionary force and the poor can be the revolutionary class. All right. Um, in the terms of communism and Marx and Engels here, what they would say is that the proletariat is the revolutionary class and that the proletariat are going to revolutionize society just as the bourgeoisie revolutionized society. That this underclass is the historical class. It's the world historic sort of spirit uh, in Hegelian terms, but they want to interpret it in a materialistic way, not in a spiritualistic ideological way. And so they want to say that the working class, because of the conditions of the factory, because of all the communication that occurs amongst the working class, because they got the numbers, uh, that the proletariat working class is the revolutionary force in society in 1848, and that this is what is going to, uh, it's the proletariat themselves on their own, of their own initiative, of their own political force that is going to take society in the right direction. That the proletariat understand, uh, you know, as they become conscious and they become conscious through the, through the effect of bourgeois production, through capitalism, the proletariat comes to consciousness. The bourgeoisie have created their own grave diggers because the proletariat is able to organize itself and able to move the revolution forward. Um, and in the months after the, the publication of the Communist Manifesto, there were lots of fledgling proletariat revolutions throughout Europe. So, uh, you know, they did have their finger on the pulse of what was going on. Um, now, uh, here is where Dussel uh, comes into play. And, and so this, uh, and, and so I'm really focusing on this, this sentence here, when Fourier and Owen and others were, were writing about utopian social 
conceptualism, the proletariat was still in its infancy. It hadn't fully developed. And so they didn't see the full potential of the proletariat. Um, now, from the per perspective of Dussel, in the Latin American experience, he sees that Latin America was largely left out of the modern bourgeois development. That yes, as nations and as territory and as resources, Latin America was exploited on a grand scale by bourgeois imperialism. And, and, and so Dussel does have this Marxism-Leninism perspective of uh, imperialism as the highest form or a higher form of capitalism. And, um, and uh, this idea of development that uh, core nations and the core nation like the United States is always trying to help Latin American countries develop and become modernized and become industrialized. Uh, but in their in the way that they help is to you know give loans that then go to uh, elites and you know uh, they the United States sends in uh, or, or trains death squads to get rid of you know uh, people who are more socialist in in inclination and you know there's just all these sort of problems with this idea of development developed by uh, the bourgeois state uh, of the U.S. Empire. Um, so, so Dussel is thinking about this, you know, now from this 1960s, 1970s perspective, while liberation theology is developing, and then Dussel also now in the book that we're reading is relatively recent. I think it was just published in 2018. You know, so he's he's had a little bit more time to digest this 20th century history, uh, as opposed to Gutierrez and, and Romero. <clears throat> and and he's thinking that Latin America has been left out of modern history, has been left out of modern philosophical development, and ha and because Latin America has been on the periphery, not totally excluded, but always like just on the border, half in and half out of bourgeois global. Uh, capitalism, uh, that Latin America can speak in the terms of the bourgeois empire, but it can also speak in terms of a purely Latin American experience, and it has the resource, one, you know, really fundamental resource is the indigenous cultures that still exist in Latin America. Uh, you know, in, in North America, we have uh, First Nations in Canada and we have Native Americans in, in the United States, but um, their populations have been decimated and there are ways in which Native Americans in the North America were integrated much more thoroughly into bourgeois society. But in places even in Mexico, uh, like Chiapas, uh, there's an indigenous, you know, there's an indigenous culture there that is not, is very different from standard Mexican culture. And that happens, you know, going south all throughout Latin America. You have this resource in Dussel's mind of an indigenous uh, element of culture that can think outside of the box, can think outside of the box of bourgeois imperialism. And so he wants to say that the revolutionary class is not the proletariat, and the revolutionary, uh, revolutionary class is not the poor uh, in this Christian uh, liberation theology, but the revolutionary class is the Puebla, is the people. But he, he likes to use the Spanish term Puebla uh, as to not confuse it with 
uh, liberal bourgeois notions of the people, like in uh, the Constitution of the United States and things like that. And the Puebla is this people that is on the periphery that is educated in Eurocentric uh, philosophy and economics, et cetera, et cetera, but has also experienced bourgeois imperialism uh, from the wrong side, you know, from the short end of the stick. And, and then the Puebla is also has this element of indigenous surviving indigenous culture that is a kind of spiritual root, like in the way that Romero and Gutierrez want to refer to the poor as having as being this spiritual root, this authentic spiritual uh, connection. But um, Dussel wants to distance himself from Christianity and think of indigenous culture as kind of the, the spiritual root, uh, but not totally excluding that Christian spirituality, but being, you know, inclusive of all the spirituality that's, that exists in Latin American culture. So that's interesting. And, and that's, and that's what I, you know, what I'm suggesting is the easiest, <laughs> the easiest paper topic for uh, the final paper is to talk about that notion of the Puebla, as Dussel talks about it, compare it to the notion of the poor in Gutierrez and Romero, and compare it to the proletariat in Marx and Engels, and see, after you do that comparison, does Dussel make sense, or do you have some other revolutionary class? And of course, what I'm always thinking about, and, and you know, I think this is, you know, we are living in a revolutionary moment because we're living in a time of crisis. Um, as the ecological crisis gets more and more severe, people are going to become radicalized. Now, are they going to be organized as a revolutionary force, or are they going to, is there going to be a divide and conquer strategy where you have white supremacists fighting, you know, all these, uh, you know, uh, gunning down ethnic minorities and, and bourgeois liberals taking the side of, of the ethnic minorities and, you know, then all this kind of craziness that we're seeing with like QAnon and everything. These are all strategies to divide the the underclass, you know, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, in the United States, we see this happening, you know, because the QAnon conspiracy theorists who carry uh, AR-15s and gun people down, uh, you know, those are those are, are um, those are people largely. Those are people at at the lowest rungs of society. Uh, you know, unemployed, um, struggling with opium addiction, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so, um, so as we face the ecological cataclysm, can we find a way to integrate uh, Black Lives Matter, for example, with the Proud Boys. Can this become uh, a unified political force, or and and not that every individual, you know, in each camp, is, but but that somehow we can we can create a class identity of people who are being impoverished, that are being exploited as the ecology begins to break down and whose lives existence is being threatened and, and the existence of their children is being more and more threatened. This is very personal for me. I have a three-year-old daughter. Uh, you know, by the end of her life, we're, we're deep into this crisis. And, uh, and, and, and so 
uh, is there way of is there a way of creating a a class consciousness or will it simply be the effect of history you know Marx and Engels have this kind of historical determinism that history happens and then people, you know, the proletariat becomes conscious, you know, the ecological cataclysm happens and then people become conscious. I, you know, if we let things go far enough, yes. But I think like Marx and Engels, I think we need to get propagandistic with this. We have to think ahead. We can't, we can't just be thinking about what has already happened. We have to be thinking ahead and we have to be pushing people to see into the future and to act today on behalf of the future. That's what, you know, ecological justice looks like is you got to act now. I mean, we should have acted yesterday. It's already too late, but we got to act now. And that means that a political class, the vast majority of people, like 99% of the world population, 99% of people in the United States are, are going to be um, devastated by the ecological cataclysm if we keep running in the direction that we're running. And there's no sign, there's no sign that, that political leaders are doing anything to avert this. Um, can there be a class that becomes conscious that is unifying the vast majority of people against what Marx and Engels call the bourgeoisie, what we call in American society the 1%, these ultra-rich people uh, that are making all the political and, and economic decisions, you know, Wall Street. Um, is there a way of of, of igniting that, maybe in a propagandistic way, or is there already a, a class in its infancy, like the proletariat, as Marx and Engels are talking here? What, you know, how is there, are we in a moment to see a revolutionary class that can uh, help us to avert the worst outcome of the ecological cataclysm. I think we're already too far into it to not experience the cataclysm to some extent, uh, but can we keep it from being truly cataclysmic? Uh, can it just be a crisis and, and then we head towards, uh, you know, uh, a socialist future or a utopian future or whatever you want to call it. And Dussel now, he does bring in Christianity quite a bit to talk about an es eschatological uh, sort of future, like uh, a new Jerusalem, um, but you know, always speaking in metaphorical terms. He doesn't, he's not really adopting Christian theology. He's just using Christian notions as metaphors for the revolution and things like this. But is there a way, in, in really concrete terms, is there a way of just having a society that doesn't crash on the rock of human ecology? Can we weather the storm by, or, by a self-organizing group do you see that as possible? Or are we just doomed to be divided like Proud Boys versus the Black Lives Matter people or, and, and be dependent upon bourgeois liberal politicians and, and Wall Street uh, ultra rich to solve all of our problems? You know, do we have to rely on Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos who, you know, is sending himself in a rocket ship uh, on joy rides. Uh, Elon Musk, you know, are these these are are these our saviors? Uh, so, how do you see us averting the ecological cataclysm? And does Dussel's idea of the Puebla? Uh, 
uh, make sense as a way of conceiving of the revolutionary class. So that's really my main question for the final essay. But you know, if you want to take it in other directions, I, I leave that open, you know, just to give you some options there. Because some of us are, you know, already have our own ideas. Uh, and I want to hear about those ideas. Okay, so <clears throat> continuing on. Since the development of class antagonism keeps even pace with the development of industry, the economic situation, as they find it, does not as yet offer to them the material conditions for the emancipation of the proletariat. They therefore search after a new social science, after new social laws that are to create these conditions. Okay, and here uh, in line with what I was just saying, you know, maybe we're not deep enough into the ecological cataclysm uh, for the revolutionary class, the eco-revolutionary class to really emerge. Maybe the, the social economic conditions are not ripe for that, for that revolutionary class. Maybe we have to get deeper into it and people have to really start hurting before they become class conscious. That would be another way of, of discussing this. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't like that option, but uh, that might be true, you know, whether I like it or not. Um, historical action is to yield to their personal inventive action, historically created conditions of emancipation to in fantastic ones, and the gradual, spontaneous class organization of the proletariat to the organization of society specially contrived by these inventors. This is utopianism. Future history revolves itself in their eyes into the propaganda and the practical carrying out of their social plans. And maybe I'm being utopian in what I was just saying about let's do it now rather than later. Maybe we just have to wait and it has to get worse. Uh, maybe I'm being utopian. So that's another way of, of uh, addressing this whole issue. Uh, in the formation of their plans, they are conscious of caring chiefly for the interest of the working class as being the most suffering class. Only from the point of view of being the most suffering class does the proletariat exist for them. Uh, and that's very similar to what I was just saying, right, about people suffering from the ecological cataclysm, and that's what defines them. The undeveloped state of the class struggle, as well as their own surroundings, causes socialists of this time to consider themselves far superior to all class antagonisms. They want to improve the condition of every member of society, even that of the most favored, even of the bourgeoisie. Hence, they habitually appeal to society at large without distinction of class, nay, by preference to the ruling class. For how can people, when once they understand their system, fail to see in it the best possible plan of the best possible state of society? All right, so this is, you know, um, maybe, maybe this paragraph uh, legitimates what I was saying, thinking of, uh, you, know, you know, identifying the 1% as, as the problem. Um, if we don't identify the 1% as the problem, then we're definitely in the, in a utopianism. You know, if we think that we're all just going to sing Kumbaya with Elon Musk and Bill Gates and it's all going to work out fine, uh, that's utopianism. That's a fantasy. Hence, they reject all political and especially all revolutionary action. They wish to attain their ends by peaceful means, peaceful protest and endeavor by small experiments, necessarily doomed to failure, and by the force of example to pave the way for the new social gospel. And there was, this social gospel thing was, was a thing, uh, where Christianity, especially through the influence of, of liberal Christianity in Germany, in the United States, and everywhere, uh, people started to think of a social gospel, and they thought of socialism as like, the fulfillment of all this idea of the second coming of Jesus in a kind of spiritualized, metaphorical way. Not that Jesus is really going to come out of the sky, but that developing gradually out of Christian spiritualism and out of uh, peaceful action and out of uh, 
uh, altruism, that we would enter the kingdom of God uh, in a way, but but not in a fantastic way. Just you know that what Christianity really is about is reaching this socialist society where all class antagonisms have been resolved. Um, A, a, and so, you know, so here, and, and this is something that students often fall into, um, students are always saying peaceful protest, peaceful protest is good, uh, but at the same time, they seem to legitimate the most grotesque torture and, and uh, dropping of bombs, uh, anything that the U.S. Empire does that is violent and horrific, that's fine. But normal ordinary people have to always be peaceful peaceful you know you don't you don't want to be violent but you live in a system of violence we are dropping bombs today on children like this is how the empire survives is on violence so uh you know think about that um you know and sometimes in my classes i do do like sort of focus on the question of violence because this is uh, something that we all just, and it's this liberal bourgeois, you know, Democratic Party, oh, peaceful protests, you know, the largest peaceful protest in the history of the universe was in uh, early 2003, when people in the United States got together on the street in the largest numbers ever seen anywhere in the universe to protest against the war and the the war proceeded without a hitch. Yeah. Yeah, if you wanna if you wanna do a gesture, if you wanna make a statement, you know, cut your hair a fancy way or go peacefully protest. Uh, they're both about as effective. <clears throat> okay. Hence, these utopian socialists, they reject all political and especially all revolutionary action. They wish to attain their ends by peaceful means and endeavor by small experiments necessarily doomed to failure and by the force of example to pave the way for the new social gospel. Okay, and small experiments like uh, New Harmony, uh, 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 Owens City, New Harmony, um, you know, as an experiment, as interesting as an experiment, but doomed to failure. Okay. Such fantastic pictures of future society painted at a time when the proletariat is still in a very undeveloped state and has but a fantastic conception of its own position correspond with the first instinctive yearnings of that class for a general reconstruction of society. But these socialist and communist publications contain also a critical element. Okay, so this is critical utopian socialism, this critical element. They attack every principle of existing society. Hence, they are full of the most valuable materials for the enlightenment, enlightenment of the working class. The practical measures proposed in them, such as the abolition of the distinction between town and country, of the family, of the caring of industries for the account of private individuals, and of the wage system, the, uh, the proclamation of social harmony, the conversion of the functions of the state into a mere superintendence of production. All of these proposals point solely to the disappearance of class antagonisms, which were at the time only just cropping up, and which in these publications are recognized in their earliest indistinct and undefined forms only. These proposals, therefore, are of a purely utopian character. Okay, um, and I might say here, in relationship to the ecological cataclysm and the eco-revolutionary class, uh, perhaps the proletariat, as it's described by Marx and Engels, is merely a class in its infancy that is yet to become the eco-revolutionary class. Perhaps, this could be turned against Marx and Engels 
to say that they were utopian because they believed that it was in their moment that the conditions had, had finally arisen, uh, where the, the contradictions of capitalism had come to their uh, highest extent. But we've seen capitalism survive and, and evolve um, for another 150, 170 years now. Um, and maybe now it's only in our time that the conditions for the truly revolutionary class is arising. And maybe we have to get deeper into the crisis uh, for it to fully develop. Um, you know, we need to think about criticizing Marx and Engels and think about criticizing ourselves. And you just want to keep on bouncing back and criticizing what you find interesting in other people's ideas, not what you don't find interesting, what you do find interesting, that's somehow enticing to you, and then fight against it, fight against the, the inclination, the enticing character of it, and then turn that against yourself, and don't let yourself entice yourself into things. And this is being critical. This is always being uh, ultimately self-critical. The significance of critical utopian socialism and communism bears an inverse relation to historical development. In proportion as the modern class struggle develops and takes definite shape, this fantastic standing apart from the contest, these fantastic attacks on it, lose all practical value and all theoretical justification. Therefore, although the originators of these systems were in many respects revolutionary, their disciples have, in every case, formed mere reactionary sects. You know, moving off to new harmony is not going to change society. That's not revolutionary. You're just separating off and, and uh, going off into the countryside to, to gradually disappear. They hold fast to the original views of their masters in opposition to the progressive historical development of the proletariat. They therefore endeavor in that consistently to de deaden the class struggle and to reconcile the class antagonisms. They still dream of experimental realization of their social utopias, of founding isolated uh, phalansteries. Uh, this is Fourier's, um, he talked of a phalanstery is, is his model of a, a commune kind of similar to Owen's ideas, establishing home colonies of setting up little Acaria, uh, duodecimal editions of the New Jerusalem, uh, and to realize all these castles in the air. They are compelled to appeal to the feelings of and purses of the bourgeois. So with all these fancy ideas and building castles in the sky and moving out into the country and starting a commune, buying a city, buying New Harmony like Owen did, that takes a lot of money. Who has the money? The bourgeoisie. That means you need bourgeois patrons in order to do anything. You have to grovel at the feet of the 1% to do anything. And if you're groveling at the feet of the bourgeoisie, you're not revolutionary. Um, by degrees, they sink into the category of the reactionary conservative socialists depicted above because they have to grovel at the feet and to convince the bourgeoisie that they're not really revolutionary, uh, they actually become reactionary. Differing from these only by more systematic pedantry and by their fanatical and superstitious belief in miraculous effects of their social science. They therefore violently oppose all political action on the part of the working class. Such action, according to them, can only result from blind unbelief in the new gospel. The Owenites in England, the Fourierists in France, respectively, oppose the Chartists and the Reformists. Okay, so Chartists, I discussed, that was happening in England, the, the Reformista. Uh, were in France and kind of similar, uh, but the Chartists, um, this was the Charter of 1838 and then the subsequent movement that grew up around that, uh, often turned into violent confrontation with bourgeois um, police and military. <clears throat> and, and so we're actually revolutionary Owenites were you know creating their alternate 
labor currency and moving off to new harmony and not really engaging in the class struggle. Okay. 